Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, a really warm welcome from C Focus to all our panelists, as well as the audiences that have joined us this evening. Um, so this session, as you all know, is part of a series um, of our C Spotlight Talks, um, specially curated by Art Asia Pacific as part of C Focus. So just to give you a brief introduction about C Focus, um, it is a curated showcase of contemporary art uh, from Southeast Asia, organized by the Singapore Tyler Print Institute. And it is the anchor event of Singapore Art Week. And this year it returns for the fourth edition. Um, and we're very excited to feature 24 galleries, over 50 artists and 150 plus artworks. So the platform is currently open to the public at Tanjung Paga District Park, um, and it will carry on till the 23rd of January. You can get your tickets um, online through cystic.com um, or cfocus.sg. In addition, this year, we are very excited to announce for the first time, um, we've got an exciting fringe program at pop-up screening room, The Projector X at Riverside Point. And this program will feature over 20 compelling regional artist made films and video works from this Wednesday, 19th to the 21st of January. So you can buy tickets for that program um, through projector.sg. And of course, you can find out more about our other talks that are happening as part of C Focus um, through our website for the rest of the week. And now I will hand it over to HG from Art Asia Pacific, um, who will be moderating um, this talk. Thanks, May. Uh, thanks to everyone at C Focus for uh, helping us put together this program and for being the kind of platform and the occasion for all of us to gather and uh, even in this virtual setting. Um, but it's uh, great that um, things are happening in 2022 and um, that things are happening in Singapore. So congratulations to everyone for the opening. Um, and sorry that we're we're not there, but we'd hope to be. But you know, uh, COVID happens. So, um, so anyway, what what we were sort of imagining to to kind of convene tonight was a kind of conversation um, about uh, really about what it means to be an artist at this moment in time and just our lives and and the world in general. Um, and, and for Art Asia Pacific, we were thinking about this talk series around this idea of pivoting to the future, um, not because um, where things are you know, clear or at, where the, uh, COVID is over or the pandemic is over. I mean, we all know that it's ongoing, but um, we were just thinking about different ways that the art world is sort of shifting and artistic practices and the way we talk about things or the way we interact with people, you know, uh, these major global disruptive events have, have shifted the way we, we do things, or they might shift, or they're starting to shift. Um, so we thought it would be interesting to hear from some of the artists who are participating in, in C Focus and whose works are featured, um, just especially to kind of see or witness this kind of diversity of practice, which really is the, the kind of hallmark of a lot of contemporary art. Um, and then beyond just seeing it, like hearing from the artists. And then also I wanted to have a chance to just dig a little deeper with some of the artists into, you know, their, not just the, what they make, but also their practice, their life and the re relationship life has to art uh, in, in this time. And then also, um, you know, I, I'm interested in like what kind of skills or what kind of experiences have been formative uh, and really contributed to the the building of a practice. Um, so I'm gonna ask uh, each of the four artists here uh, with us this evening to give a kind of brief introduction um, just to, so that people can get a sense of where they're coming from and the different um, modes in which they work. Um, and then afterwards, I'll, I'll sort of ask some general and, and also maybe specific questions um, to each of them. And um, so if you have audience members, if, if people have questions, please use the uh, question and answer um, and we'll try to get to those at the end. Um, whether you have specific or general questions, I'll kind of moderate those. And yeah, so I will first we'll hear from uh, Navin Nutong, uh, whose works are being shown through Bangkok City City Gallery. And then next, uh, Aaron Sonario, who's showing with Real Projects. 
and then Don Ng, uh, who's showing uh, with Sullivan and Strump. And then finally, uh, Tammy Nguyen is going to, uh, who's showing with the Tropical Futures Institute, uh, will talk about her work. So we'll, we'll have these short presentations, um, hopefully around five to seven minutes, um, so that there's some, some visuals to the art. And then, uh, and then we'll uh, talk all together. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Navin. Mm -hmm. Uh, who's going to do a uh, little share screen, a little introduction. I may interrupt if the presentations get a little bit long, so forgive me in advance for that. Navin, you want to take it away? Good evening, everyone. So, so I'm going to try to explain my practice. Besides, and allow this like painting the popular. Uh, I'm not Nguyen Tong. I I'm, I'm, uh, live and work in Bangkok, Thailand, actually. This one is called Populous. So it's an it, uh, it, uh, oil paint on black canvas. So it actually, I made it in, in like, in this new year to set a milestone for my long project that I, I have some project that made about this issue, like three projects from last year and I still develop it for next year. So I'm gonna start by explaining that, that exhibition that it connect. So actually my, my practice is always attached to the relation between two words, simulation and history. And ac actually the last year exhibition, the first from this like project actually come from the, the, the question how game teach us to renail the history. And first it come as a book and it coming to the exhibition. Uh, the first one from the last year January last year called Immortal by BC this day. I'm gonna explain it shortly. Actually, it's about the, it have two section. The first section is more like the video installation that have the big wooden sign uh, told you the narrative and the tales of the boy who had the three conceal about the question of history and, and somehow he have a journey with the three simulation tree and explore the, the, the simulation world and stuff. So it, it, the first one is about the attitude of the question that I gave you like last slide. And the, and, 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 and the second section is all about the, actually some people call it encyclopedia installation or for me it's kind of like the content page of the whole project because the thing that I do with this installation is I, I, I have a, I have some weird question about the history, uh, especially the, the, the history of Southeast Asia and with Thailand and with, with like our neighbors. So I try to collect off the object from game and from, from because uh, my other job is actually a factory manager. So I am uh, interested in how demand and supply uh, manufacturing something and spread it out into the community. So actually the toy from game, the, the toy from China, the counterfeit are uh, of the interest that I have. So I, I try to uh, combine together with, with, with the object in virtual and object in, in cultural and try to see the constellation and, and really understand so many things. So, so in this part, so many question coming out from the process. And in other hand, actually you can, we have a website named BC Immortal. It can like, uh, actually I work with my friend who have the, who practice the social practice. So he have some, some coding method that we work together. Actually he giving us, he, he coding off the subject and off the, he placing off the object. And, and actually this pro project uh, I need some more dialogue actually, but, but the thing that coming out is uh, somehow we understand that the word ancientness and the word history can explain the, cannot explain the object in the world show. It explain it different way. And, 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 and the, the far we go, the far we understand that uh, the, right now we understand the object in real life enough. We, we can understand the spoon enough, what, what it talks to our culture, but we didn't un understand the the spoon in game and the table in game or something like that. So the, the process is going on, going on and stuff. So this, this is kind of like the, the object that sit in the, in the show. It's kind of like, because I interest in the manufacturer, right? So I try to collect various objects. I'm like the horse from, 
t r a d i t i o n Thai dance combined with the the, the fashion fashion object s o m e like the some cool robe or some Playmobil distribution with Thai amulet flame or something, and also the show f u l with the screen that 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 displaying uh, some virtual object that 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 give it give it a new present and, and replicate something like that. And actually, the paint uh, I gonna explain about the stroke and something later. But but actually, the painting set and explain the show in the different way of. Those artwork that it it kind of explain the backbone of the and somehow other other question that come later because I I understand what I'm understand with my practice so far is I want to when I start with the question I didn't I don't need answer but I need some more question to go around and understand the the the, the sequence or the the subject so actually the painting is kind of kind of Uh, collect and forming the question and uh, stuff. Actually, the painting talk about the show in different way. This one talk about the show that which the old god and the ancient god are like hiding for the long time, and 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 somehow today they have a variant threshold, some like game and media and culture and and those stuff. Somehow how how they tramp on, how they like uh, travel by by time, and I want to. Uh, so a little about my journey from 2014 to now. On 2014, actually, I interned at Speedy Grandma. On that day, I want to be a kid. I badly want to be a curator, and I make so many shows. So, on on those period, I try to practice being curator and being curator assistant. Try to being a, a good underground gallerist. Uh, finding some knowledge from like the olders. And friend and 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 other people that pass by the community of Speedy Grandma. So, but but I do a lot of chore. This is map by is one of my chore about the 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 new notion of map that that computer age giving us and how how new generation approach to map different from from the 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 older. And actually, I'm the curator. I'm the I'm the bad curator because I can't do any right thing. So many people write for me. So actually, the the stock and drawing are the 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 tool that I collect my first question and 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 try to give it to other. My approach of curating are uh, always. I always think that exhibition and the uh, 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 group art show are uh, the a uh, we together work as a knowledge mining and and like solving question together. So so. So my weird drawing and my like my question in those drawing and stroke are the the thing that I hardly work about it and and it it Thanks. always being a milestone. So. Yes. Thanks, I mean that was that was a great uh, sort of overview of both of your kind of the many aspects of your practice and um, I'm, I'm maybe we'll come back to the the idea of drawing as a kind of bedrock of your practice as well that spans kind of curating to also artistic practice because I think that's an interesting one especially for say a younger artist thinking about where to start but like because drawing is such a fundamental uh, kind of skill set that you know you learn when you're maybe a teenager or You know, early on in your sort of artistic training, and you don't always know the the ways that it becomes uh, applicable. You know, later in 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 life, but it, you know, as people sometimes say, like drawing is a way of organizing the world or organizing information, whether it's visual or intellectual. So that's that's interesting. Um, Aaron, Jun, do you guys want to uh, do a little introduction here on on Aaron's practice and what uh, what you're showing at C Focus? Okay, so. Uh... Yeah, my name is Arin. I decided to speak in Bahasa Indonesia, so my friend Jun will be your tra translator. Yes, It's going to be more uh, efficient and yeah, uh, precise. So I'm going to share screen now. So this is my studio. Uh, my background, background saya tu lukis. Tapi waktu dalam prosesnya. Uh, saya menemukan resin itu menjadi sangat relevan karena uh, jadi uh, bisa 
melukis dengan dengan metodologi metodologi yang jadi lebih beyond beyond painting. So uh, Aaron uh, started out studying uh, painting, uh, but he discovered this medium of resin that he found to open up a whole new uh, set of possibilities in his practice beyond uh, the conventional canvas. Karena resin itu uh, ya sebagai material juga dia uh, sangat uh, relate dengan uh, praktek uh, lukis ya uh, sebagai uh, media untuk mempreserve uh, pigment, mempreserve juga material karena saya juga akhirnya bisa bereksplorasi dengan pigment-pigment uh, pigment natural yang berasal dari uh, volcanic ash, dari rempah-rempah, uh, dari uh, mineral sehingga karya-karya itu sendiri uh, uh, subject matter-nya juga dimunculkan dari si pigment-pigment tersebut. Resin is particularly fascinating for Aaron because of its uh, vast potential in terms of uh, being able to uh, preserve um, many things. Um, this includes uh, natural materials such as volcanic ash. It includes pigments uh, that he's uh, been working on uh, for many years, uh, as well as um, other uh, materials such as uh, food yes. uh, at the time, um, as well as other things that um, he's been uh, continuously Um, working. Pada saat ini um, saya lebih banyak mengeksplor untuk kebetulan uh, mendapatkan uh, kelapa sawit, kemudian batu bara yang uh, dari apa dari dari pertas dari tambang sehingga tema-tema uh, karya-karya sendiri juga merespon dari material-material yang saya pakai saat saat ini. Kemudian sebetulnya saya uh, bermula dari pengetahuan yang nol. Tapi ketika mendapatkan material tersebut, saya jadi belajar. Jadi seni itu buat saya adalah uh, kendaraan untuk saya untuk belajar sesuatu yang baru. So, uh, most recently, uh, Aaron's been working on uh, a new body of work using uh, palm oil as a pigment, as well as uh, coal. And he found that actually mining uh, all of this information both figuratively and literally uh, also provides a certain context uh, for his his work itself. Uh, Aaron always starts from uh, a process of discovery that uh, he doesn't know anything uh, about how to begin or uh, how to uh, how to conduct the process. For instance, in, in learning this entire process of using resin as a, as a medium for painting, he came about it from not understanding it at all. And for him, that's sort of what makes uh, things interesting is uh, to look at his art practice as a methodology for uh, learning and learning from scratch even. Yeah. Uh, juga, uh, Uh, project yang waktu 2020 uh, karena waktu itu harus nggak uh, bisa uh, offline jadinya kita melakukan uh, display dan uh, presentasi di rumah waktu itu kolaborasi dengan uh, Shaggy Ratawulan istri saya uh, dan di uh, di rumah jadi ini uh, penampilannya In 2020, because of all of the inherent limitations of uh, the pandemic, um, Arin thought about how to perhaps present uh, his work in a different way. And at the time, um, because he couldn't uh, leave his house and studio, um, that was where we uh, presented Arin's work. Um, the presentation was then uh, transmitted online. And it was uh, shown uh, for 2020's edition of Art Basel Hong Kong, actually. Yeah. Karya yang ini terutama uh, uh, karya yang uh, terbuat dari telur, 
uh, jadi saya menggoreng telur dalam ukuran yang sangat besar itu sebenarnya uh, uh, apa ya gesture kegiatan-kegiatan sehari-hari yang yang kita lakukan di rumah uh, juga saya ini juga uh, melakukan hal yang sama gitu dengan dengan uh, praktek dan medium yang dia biasa lakukan uh, di rumah. In one of the works in the presentation called Sunny Side Down, uh, Arin uh, literally uh, placed fried eggs into one of his paintings and uh, preserved it using resin. And this work was particularly important to him because it captures um, an aspect of his daily life that, um, and perhaps for many of us, uh, became uh, particularly important. And kemudian um, pameran yang beri, uh, project yang berikutnya saya men, uh, memutuskan untuk uh, mendisplay karyanya di uh, perkebunan perkebunan pribadi yang di situ di mana ada tanaman-tanaman sayuran, buah-buahan, uh, juga uh, bumbu-bumbu yang uh, pigmen yang saya pakai saat itu adalah uh, dari kelapa sawit. Uh, dan juga uh, saya melihat menarik kenapa karyanya ada di situ karena permukaan uh, lukisan saya itu selalu uh, glossy dan ada refleksinya ketika karyanya ditaruh di situ ternyata uh, refleksi dari uh, lingkungan di sekitarnya itu membuat uh, uh, ada interaksi menarik dialog menarik terhadap karya uh, dengan 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 pigmen itu sendiri. The next presentation um... Arin did, which was for Art Basel Hong Kong 2021, actually uh, for a solo presentation, because again, um, the constraints were such that it was difficult to show his works in a public setting. Uh, Arin decided to uh, do a presentation uh, of his works on, uh, on the hill, hillsides of Bandung in a garden that he grows uh, different plants, herbs, and vegetables in. And in this uh, body of work, he was using uh, palm oil as the primary medium. And uh, here he also reached a new discovery in that because uh, the surface of his paintings are reflective in nature, that the surrounding environments and their respective reflections on the surface of the paintings became in some way, shape or form a part of the work itself. Ya, um, saya melihatnya karya-karya yang memang memang si palm oil ini uh, secara politik juga uh, punya punya narasi-narasi uh, tertentu ya, cuman kalau dilihat uh, secara uh, perspektif lain, ini juga sebuah kebutuhan yang sangat uh, apa primer untuk uh, kehidupan uh, kita, gitu. karena ini uh, sebuah, uh, sebuah sebuah kita sehari-hari mengkonsumsi uh, minyak. Although uh, it, it may appear to be the case that uh, there may be some political insinuations regarding palm oil uh, and its ecological uh, ramifications, for instance, from uh, looking at it from another vantage point, uh, what are in this also interested in is uh, how palm oil pervades into our daily lives in such a uh, in such an important way, and so many of our um, of the things that we we use every day uh, is or contains palm oil. You guys want to show one more slide? Can I jump in there? Sure. So yeah, okay. in it. Ini uh, aktivitas lain yang saya sedang banyak terlibat. Ini ada uh, bapak saya kebetulan uh, mempunyai sebuah apa a space yang sudah berumur 23 tahun di situ bisa uh, menjadi sebuah, sebuah kayak pusat budaya uh, sudah berkembang menjadi pusat budayaan di kota Bandung. Uh, kegiatannya sudah uh, banyak berlangsung dari pameran-pameran. Uh, seni, performance, ar ar arsitektur, 
uh, ya dan lain-lain. Jadi ini selain bisa membangun network juga sebagai seniman, juga uh, saya mengundang para uh, teman-teman sekalian yang tertarik untuk bisa uh, terlibat nanti kalau keadaan sudah menjadi normal. So the last thing that uh, Arie wanted to share, uh, which is his sort of the other thing that he um, spends a lot of his time in doing is um, to uh, help to run uh, this uh, what has become a cultural space in Bandung that was initiated by his father actually 23 years ago called Salasar Sunario. And it's a place where um, there are an interdisciplinary uh, series of uh, activities uh, that involve uh, art, architecture, design, performance, and uh, other things. And his aspiration is such that when the situation does get better, that we can invite all of you to come to Bandu to see it. That would be great. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> And we definitely look forward to that. Uh, th thanks, thanks, Aaron, for sharing both your work and a little bit about uh, the sort of larger community. Maybe we'll come back to that idea too. I'm interested in that. Uh, and thanks, Jen, for translating. Um, Dawn, do you want to um, share a few things with us? Sure. Let me share screen. Okay, um, right, so as a brief introduction to my practice, um, I work across a wide range of mediums, including painting, photography, film, collage, light, sculpture, and large-scale installations. While my work is often visually defined by, um, I guess, a nuance used of color, light, and text, I think it is more importantly anchored by my obsession with three things, and that's time, memory, and the ephemeral. So since this discussion um, is about work in the pandemic years of 2020 um, and beyond, I've kept to sharing a few slides that show work distinctly um, made or shown during this period. So here we go. Um, the first is an installation titled Merry Go Round and it's set in a large industrial warehouse um, where time has literally paused in Singapore. Um, it is a site-specific work and, and responds to the idea of time and space in this context. Um, it explores some basic ideas about the physics of time and, and my obsession with black holes and, and time's linearity. So, you know, it, it's, the, the work is actually constructed to mirror the radial face of a clock. And it is the movement of the viewer that opens up portals when that viewer moves clockwise according to the work. Um, if that viewer were to move anti-clockwise, the work shutters up in a soft folding of gradient tones. Um, and, and to give the sense that, you know, the idea that time only moves in one direction and you can always go forward, but you can never go back in time. Um, secondly, due to its circular structure, the bending and bouncing of reflections create a lenticular sort of illusions of space as you move around the outside of the work. So it, as, you, as you sort of make that rotation around this clock face, you would start to see pockets of space um, that hover within the work. The second work um, is one that took root in 2018 but was commissioned by the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore in a way that allowed me to fully realize how I had always envisioned the execution of this work. Um, the work is titled, uh, the series is titled Perfect Stranger. And this work is a work about holding time between two people. And you can see much earlier on when it was in the gallery, um, it has been shown in quite a few different iterations on the floor, on in a very dark uh, vacuum of, of space, almost like a, a you know a galaxy. It's been shown as billboards as well, but ultimately, when it was shown in the museum, um, in this 
kind of sense, uh, it's kind of in this kind of layout and structure that feels very much um, like a memorial was the way that I always wanted to show it. Perfect Stranger is a work about holding time between two people. And it will actually stem from a year long project between a stranger and this really psychologist um, that I met in the Singapore Art Museum and myself. Um, so over the course of 365 days, we had made a pact and an agreement where every single day she would ask me a question and I would respond. And this, this project culminated in sort of this tapestry of words, stories, confessions, questions, poems, and rants, which forms the narrative time capsule of home and of Singapore and of two women um, speaking in an undulating sea of hues that mirror the emotionality of each text. The third series, um, which I would like to talk about is Into Air, uh, is what I can only describe as a crazy ongoing exploration and quest to hold time again in a color, shape and form. And basically I've spent the last three years freezing and sculpting bulks of pigment, then documenting and shaping their inevitable collapse through photography, film and painting. This work came into being during a period when time itself stood still for the world, um, you know, during the, the COVID pandemic. And even the space that these works were shown at in Singapore reflect the state um, and the point of time in which my gallery gave up their permanent space. Um, hence, pushing forward with a solo during this point meant that the curator, gallery director, and I had to find an alternative space. And in this case, we found a beautiful derelict industrial living space that ultimately lent a beautiful synergy with a series that was you know, truly based on time and its passing. Beautiful, right? Okay. What were you gonna say? Sorry, Don, go ahead. Not at all. I was like, that's it <laughs> from my end. Thank you. No, no, thank you for sharing. Also, the installation here is a really beautiful, this architecture. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to ask you more about this um, idea of being a multi hyphenate artist, <laughs> which is how you <laughs> describe yourself. Um, but maybe, maybe we'll let uh, Tammy give an introduction to her work and then uh, we can come back to this idea also of, um, yeah, how, how, how you think about your practice these days when you're when we're all kind of working in all these different media and in these different venues and yeah yeah the the lines between these disciplines have definitely been falling away for all of us so Tammy do you want to show us some images yeah thank you thank you for getting up so early <laughs> the sun has on risen the east coast of the United States. on the east coast <laughs> all right thank you everyone for coming um let me just play this real quick all right. Um, so I uh, work across a variety of mediums, mainly in painting. Um, these are two paintings that I have on exhibit um, on exhibit right now at MoMA PS1 in as a part of Greater New York 2021. Um, I also make artist books. Um, this is a selection of artist books that I've made in the last year um, or the last past year. One of these is also in the Greater New York exhibition. And this was a series of artist books that explored passing through a cave and thinking a lot about the Ho Chi Minh Trail and Plato's allegory. And I'm also the publisher of Passenger Pigeon Press, where I make artist books and zines and collaborate with people from all different disciplines and uh, expertise and perspectives and localities. Um, this is a picture of my studio. I'm, this is about an hour outside of New York in a small town called Easton, Connecticut. And this, um, that's the barn where I do everything and the other picture is a picture of the inside of my studio and you can see that I've got the four paintings for C Focus um, right over there on that distant wall. Um, so I would say that I you know despite working across many different uh, mediums I'm really interested in contradiction and I'm interested in stirring confusion and I'm interested in collapsing ideas and subjects that seem disparate 
but through the process of art making and art presentation, um, they seem completely intrinsically related to each other. And so the works that I have created for C Focus um, actually bring together a few um, subjects that I have been interested in for a long time. And the two subjects are the Bandung Conference and a place called Forest City in Malaysia, but actually it's in between Malaysia and, and Singapore. Uh, these are the four paintings that are at C Focus now. And I am presenting it with um, the wonderful Tropical Futures Institute um, friends uh, who I met through social media and now um, are, we are collaborators and I'm so happy and excited to work with them. So I learned about the Bandung Conference in 2017 when I was visiting Jogjakarta um, for another reason. And I had found a book of uh, the different speeches that were given at the Indonesian Art Archive in Jogjakarta. And I was so um, inspired. I had never heard of anything like this before. Um, so in 1955, 29 African and Asian countries gathered in Bandung, Indonesia to denounce colonialism, racism, and nuclear war. And pictured here is the main hall of the Bandung Conference um, in 1955. Um, what was provocative to me though, was that as I kept uh, learning more and more about this historical moment, I became interested in, in the ideas of why it's been frequently called a failure. And, and by contrast, there's this idea of the Bandung spirit too. And I'm interested in how the spirit of friendship and unity and non-alignment could also result in this idea of failure. Um, so I, the first project that I did related to the Bandung Conference was actually a collaboration with some friends under Passenger Pigeon Press. So we want, it was, um, it was uh, a collaboration that took place in Washington, DC, but I'm showing you these two pictures here. Um, to the left is a picture of, um, a, a selection of Bandung delegates who are eating together. And then to on the right is a picture of um, the Chinese Premier Chou Enlai eating with uh, President Nixon. And what my friends and I decided to do is we wanted to sort of unpack the Bandung conference through um, a sort of staged stately dinner that took place at this hotel called the Eaton DC, which is not so far away from the White House. And what we did was we recreated an artist book experience where folks would um, arrive and learn about the Bandung Conference and also kind of reflect on this moment of a very felt racial strife in America um, through the eating and reading experience of an artist book and a very curated meal. And so what you see here, are the pictures from the dinner and then below is the artist book that we created um, uh, for this event. These are just some pictures that I um, drew of the different leaders that were at the Bandung Conference. And you'll see that these become really relevant to the project presented at Sea Focus in a few minutes. So then put the Bandung Conference aside, a few years ago, um, I visited Forest City. So Forest City was, um, you know, a, a project that I had read about in the news years ago. And I was so mesmerized by this I idea. So it's a man-made island in between Malaysia and Singapore. It's completely tax-free. Um, it's made through the process of la uh, sand reclama land reclamation by compressing sand from other places. Um, and it lauds itself as totally sustainable, um, having massive varieties of plant. Um, and what I did was I um, 
I visited there pretending to be an investor. I, I called the sales office and I told them that I wanted to buy a property. And they took me on this very elaborate tour of Forest City. Um, this is just the drone footage of, 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 of Forest City in its construction. Um, and this is one of the units that I could buy for myself. Um, and I was so sort of interested in how Forest City kind of encapsulated markers of success, markers of capital, um, but then it also kind of, um, you know, really emphasized notions of family value um, under this kind of, um, you know, utopian vision, um, something that was really provocative that was said over and over again to me was that there was no climate change in Forest City, um, that if I were to come, it would be a wonderful place for me to retire, send my kids to private schools, and, and should I ever needed uh, cancer treatment, um, this would be an ideal place to come because it's cheaper than Singapore. Um, and the other thing that was really provocative about this place was that the plants that I saw were, were the, the biodiversity actually existed in the plastic plants that I saw all over um, the, the, the sort of showroom area. And then all of the other areas that had real plants were much more manicured and sort of there was a, a, um, a very narrow selection of plant, um, very unlike a sort of natural wild forest. Um, my research there resulted in this solo exhibition um, that happened over the summer called Freehold. It took place at a gallery called Smack Melon in Brooklyn, New York. And what was central to this um, uh, this exhibition was that I created a flag for Forest City, imagining Forest City was a sort of fantasy utopian nation. And this flag features um, a perfect circular white sun, which I am thinking about um, Plato's allegory of the cave, thinking about, you know, sort of the sun as being the source of all illumination and wisdom and truth. And then also thinking about that statement that the salesperson kept saying to me, no climate change, right? I kept thinking about um, a perfect flag as needing to have these 12 stripes of blue and green representing uh, land and water that's never changing um, and also representing the hours of the day. So then collapsing my ideas um, and my interest in the Bandung Conference with Forest City, I created these four portraits for Sea Focus. And what I've done is I've casted um, leaders from the Bandung Conference as military leaders of this imagined utopian nation of Forest City. So here I've casted um, the Prime Minister of Egypt, um, Gamal Nasser, as the commander of space. So during the um, Bandung Conference, um, this was really when Nasser gained um, international recognition. Um, and then he was also someone who was an advocate for this idea of positive neutrality. And then he was also, um, you know, really kind of rallying um, this new kind of Arab League of Nations, um, including Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Syria. These are some details of the paintings. Um, and here I've casted Jar Jarraharal Nehru as the commander of air and he was the Prime Minister of India and also one of the organizers of the Bandung Conference. And he was um, very passionate about the purpose of the Bandung Conference. Actually, during um, his speech, he argued that the developing nation should not ally with either the United States or the Soviet Union because such military alliances would not benefit developing nations in the nuclear age. So here I've casted um, the Filipino Secretary of Foreign Affairs at the time, um, 
Carlos Romulo as the commander of field. Romulo actually ended up being a, a figure who was very um, interesting to me in that he held so much contradiction um, in his presence at the Bandung Conference. Um, in Richard Wright's memoir of the Bandung Conference uh, called The Color Curtain, I'm actually just going to quote this, um, he kind of distilled uh, Romulo's presence in a really uh, provocative way. He said, the Philippine delegation would be in the awkward position of having to carry water on both shoulders, would have to talk right to keep faith with Washington, and to act left to prove that she was still free in her heart and understood the language of her disinherited Asian brothers. And so here kind of Romulo sat in this this sort of contentious diplomatic situation. And he was also one of the few people that was very pointed about the racial contradictions that were present in the Bandung Conference. In his speech, he, he pointed that, that even though there was no quote unquote white nation present at Bandung, um, this notion was incorrect, um, suggesting the idea that these newly independent nations were still dependent on uh, greater nuclear powers. Yeah, and then finally, I mean, oh, sorry. This, mind if I, do you mind yeah. if I just interrupt you there? Um, no, I just, I wanted to, um, because you were just talking about this idea of community. So, and this was something that um, I wanted to ask all of the kind of panelists about. Um, and and Bandung is maybe like a good um, sort of, metaphor or I mean also in the case of Aaron like you know hometown uh, like a physical reality um, but um, yeah no I wanted to uh, maybe go back to Aaron just just ask him a little bit about um, how this uh, kind of community works um, and comes together and um, you know what what you've kind of drawn from people working in, in different disciplines. And, and of course, it would be great to then hear from all of you about like your artistic community and what <clears throat> you've learned from your um, sort of cultural collaborators. Jen, do you mind translating that for Aaron? So before before I start, uh, tell me, please uh, come to Bando. I will send you an invitation. <laughs> I want to go to Bando and uh, see your, your works. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, should I stop sharing my screen? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, I'll yeah. do that. Yeah, um, uh, mungkin dari, dari saya sih, kebetulan uh, si uh, Selasa Afternoon Art Space itu bisa menjadi uh, tempat uh, di mana kita bisa uh, berkumpul uh, dari berbagai macam kalangan. Uh, juga dan, dan, dan juga kita menjalin kemitraan dengan sekolah-sekolah, university, ITB, UNPAR, untuk uh, juga ada uh, unsur uh, akademisnya dan uh, itu juga berhubungan dengan uh, sifatnya ed uh, edukasi. So, salah satu scenario um, art space is essentially like this a place for people to gather. It's a gathering point, actually. And um, it just happened, I think, more organically. That, yeah. That, that people from different uh, disciplines and ways of looking uh, sort of come together uh, but they also um, or the, the the space also conducts partnerships uh, with the different universities and institutions uh, surrounding the space such as ITD uh, or the Bandung Institute of Technology and UNPAR which is uh, another university uh, and through these collaborations um, interesting things happen. Karena uh, di Bandung dan ya mungkin uh, di Indonesia pada saat itu in, tidak pemerintah tidak 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 uh, ada support untuk uh, di bidang seni. Jadinya rata-rata uh, di Indonesia seniman-seniman uh, uh, berinisiasi untuk membuat art space, art space dan uh, uh, ya itulah yang, yang yang banyak terjadi uh, di Indonesia. Because we don't really receive uh, governmental support and funding so much um, in Indonesia in particular, although I'm sure that this is similar uh, around the region as well. Uh, there are many artists who take it upon themselves to, to develop their own uh, 
initiatives and artist-run spaces as a result in order to help foster, develop, and engage with the community. I, I think, uh, Navin, for example, you know, you were, uh, did your curatorial fellowship, for example, at uh, Speedy Grandma, which is uh, also a kind of self-generated organization and, you know, kind of startup initiative, right, right, run by artists and, you know, just a, a grassroots initiative, which, yeah, has, has evolved over the years and become sort of a bigger, more institutionalized thing in, in Bangkok, but. Yeah, I would. Um, maybe, maybe I could ask Don actually a little bit about, um, be, I, you have this kind of collaboration uh, that and conversation, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your sort of cultural like scene and like the sort of peers in Singapore that maybe um, sort of influence or drive your work a little bit. Well, um, for me, although I, I, you know, I, I took a degree in, in fine art, my first five, 10 years out of university or out of college was really thrown into the deep end of design and advertising. And so in many ways, I don't think I am, I don't have that typical sort of a artist career path as I think a lot of artists have in Singapore where they probably went to La Salle, which is the local art school, or, and they have, because of that, built a really strong network of you know, friends and community that um, you know, have group shows and have quite a bit of grassroots um, collaborations on that front. So um, yeah, I'm a bit of a, a wild card in, in that respect, but I do um, increasingly, I think, you know, based after you know, basing my practice out of here for the past 10 years, um, found artists and actually beyond artists, writers, um, designers, architects, I mean, even a psychologist with who I worked on with for Perfect Stranger that, you know, it's true. Oftentimes having a deep curiosity about other people's practices and, and what they can do with the tools they have and the materials they have that have really allowed me to springboard. Um, yeah, I, I think I am the most curious person I know. So, um, and yeah, I have, I have a deep questioning um, to actually a lot of people and, and opportunities that I come into contact with. So, and I think that has really allowed me to like you said, make collaborations and, and work on bigger projects. Yeah. And Nav and I, so I also got this sense from you that you, you have um, friends who are, have sort of technical expertise, like you were talking about your friend who's a coder who is helping you um, with, the, with the platform, which um, as, as you were kind of starting to explain, like it's kind of like a mental map, um, like a series of uh, inspirations for your own work. Um, but I was just curious about um, these, like this idea of skill sets, because you know you have your friend who's got a particular yeah. ability with coding, and you know you were saying that earlier your kind of origins of your practice are kind of rooted in drawing. Oh, okay, um, I, I can I can explain you those mm -hmm. things by explaining the community that I surround with, right? Because I I work and like learn many things at. Speedy Grandma community, right? So it's full with, actually Speedy is full with the sociologist friend and intro friend and all of the writer, of the quarter who like, who do it for freelance and they didn't and come together and share. It's kind of like the community that, so, so in this year, in this two year, we have a protest, right? So after the protest and everyone will like, Come here to the building and sharing, starting new project. Someone like continue, continue collapsing. And that stuff. So 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 this thing led me to understand not only the skill of those technical, some like, uh, some like social and intro and writer, right? but more in like, more in attitude of the developer, how they thought about their work, how 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 computer technique thing about feminine or queer or those stuff actually it's quite like, led me to explore many aspects so. 
Tammy, to go back to you, I, do you do you think of the passenger pigeon press as this kind of way of gathering people together that you're interested in working with, and and what kind of uh, skills or, or or bodies of knowledge have you been able to access through that? Because that's a little bit like um, what Dawn was saying with her sort of even professional career, and then uh, Navin with Speedy Grandma, like as these were occasions to like meet people and learn different abilities or like uh, also find people to collaborate with um yeah i think passenger pigeon press like has really um just opened a lot of um pathways for me to learn about um folks who are working in very dis distant fields from art like for example one of my frequent collaborators now is a uh, lovely umayam who um is a nuclear policy expert um and i through um working with her on several projects from the color curtain project um to uh, we made another artist book called the atomic sublime i've learned so much about the history of nuclear mining and also just geopolitics related to uh nuclear um in terms of community building, you know, um, I think that uh, sometimes when I make the zines, the uh, the collaborators often don't meet each other, you know, so they they're kind of held together in this in this art object. So I, I wouldn't say that um, the collaboration itself builds community, but I think that the art object as it's dispersed in the mail then creates community right so it's like community by way of actually these very isolated experiences of having the book in your home and reading it and everything and then the other thing i'll say is that um the community is also created through the making of the artist books because we make 200 um zines a, a quarter um i often um engage my students and other friends um, who are just kind of around um, for these like long sessions of paper folding and cutting and gluing and stickering and things like that. And so in that way, there is a very fun and spirited camaraderie um, it, there. In terms of skill set, you know, I, I think one of the most valuable things for me um, is that, you know, I, I, I was lucky to be able to um, sort of uh, study a lot of craft um, from book binding at the Center for Book Arts. Um, that I was at a residency there where I learned a lot about making illuminated manuscripts and leather binding. When I was um, in between my undergraduate and graduate studies, I spent four years living in Vietnam. Um, the first year I learned lacquer painting at the Ho Chi Minh Fine Arts University. These um, sort of very sort of technically oriented experiences have, I think, allowed me to become very nimble now. So, so just the sort of nimbleness is something that I'm so grateful for, the sort of agility to um, create something with a certain kind of confidence, athleticism with material. Um, that I, I think that that's something when I, in hindsight, is um, very like grateful for it. And what do you guys all think about this idea of being sort of labeled like what I want to use this term from Don, like a multi hyphenate artist? Like, you know, if you have to describe yourself with these kinds of like an art fair or, you know, a platform like C Focus, like, you know, do you do you not want to be called a painter? Do you not want to be called a bookmaker? Or do you do you want to put a lot of different adjectives together? How, how have you started thinking about this? Dawn, do you want to start since yeah, I called you multi-hyphenate? <laughs> I think not even the word multi-hyphenate. I think the biggest problem I have is being called an artist sometimes. Um, I mean, what does that even mean? I think it, it, it's some, at times almost confining and, and contrived. And I think that, that, that there's so much plasticity, I mean, across practices and, and even in, in this panel that I see and, and the flexibility of, of one person to have so many more dimensions that they're interested in and are able to express themselves that sometimes I feel, you know, even the, the word multi-hyphenate or even an artist is, it's, 
it's just vocabulary. It's just words used to, to pin something down. But really, um, you are who you are and, and you are producing because that truly somehow is something that obsessively drives you and that you don't know how not to chase that or those obsessions. Now then, what about for you? How do you how do you see this kind of um, labeling? Thing about me? Yeah, okay. I just have a little conversation with my friend because I because right now I'm I'm trying to learn my discipline of being artist or because before I'm I'm scared to scare myself to to call myself curator actually, but 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 actually we I have a conversation with with my friend about the uh, because I. I have so many jobs, right? so I need to explain what I'm doing to other people than art community. Some like, some like my my other factory manager, or or my family, or my like wife family. So, it, but but what I'm learning is they they comfort for 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 labeling artists. You don't have to. They 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 they. I think I think I think I'm under. Though uh, the audience somehow love, don't want to, it's easier to explain that we are all artists or something like that. Right? This this uh, only thing that I want I can share. I still thinking about stuff, all this stuff. Aaron, maybe I'll throw this question to you. I mean, I always th I thought it was interesting that you kind of identify as you started as a painter. <laughs> So, you know, I, do you still see your practice uh, as being really rooted in painting or have you also embraced like a bigger idea of just being an artist? Mm -hmm. How do you see it? Mungkin kalau di Indonesia itu uh, artist as a patron. Uh, jadi, jadi memang presence-nya seniman untuk di community itu sangat-sangat berperan penting untuk majuan dan uh, pengaruh-pengaruh uh, seni rupa yang yang berkembang di di link di environment-nya. Well, sort of in relation to the question um, as well uh, is that aren't sees um, artists in Indonesia as having the potential to be patrons of the arts. So um, yes, I, because of that it opens up so many different possibilities as well in terms of uh, like the potential for artists to to play a role in their respective communities. Tapi maksud tapi yang nggak apa-apa juga melihat saya sebagai painter nggak masalah ya. Walaupun praktek saya itu udah menjadi seperti membuat sculpture, tapi my frame ini itu berpikir secara painting. In relation to your earlier question again, though. Um, Although uh, Aaron does uh, work in other mediums as well, in sculpture, in installation, and video making. Uh, however, um, he sees everything still within the framework of painting. So the, the statement earlier that he started out as a painter, I guess still remains that yeah. he is he is still a he started a, he started as a painter and he is still a painter. Yes, I'm a painter. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's hey, hey, I like it. I like I like that you've kept the definition but just expanded its meaning. You know. <laughs> um, maybe maybe to sort of wrap things up. Uh, even though I love talking to all of you and uh, you know I hope this is the beginning of more conversations between us. But um, maybe I would just ask you um, like what. Um, what do you tell younger artists when you meet them? Like, do you have a kind of bit of advice that you give give younger artists for like the way to find themselves as as creative people and also maybe a little bit professionally? Maybe Aaron, do you want to start with that? Mm. <laughs> uh, just be honest to yourself. And yeah. yeah. Tammy, what do you, what do you, what do you 
<laughs> yeah, just do it work. Be, be yourself. Yeah. Um. Well, I I mean I I think that I I try to. I mean, definitely what what Aaron is saying too. This idea of like being yourself, but I think that. Um, also when you're young, you're also trying to find yourself too. And so I think just encouraging young people to really make a habit of making art, being consistent, um, showing up and practicing and also trying out uh, new materials, listening to what the materials are also saying to you. I think that sometimes you can go in thinking that you might be a painter, but you're not, you know, like really listening to what you have uh, affinities to. I remember when I was in art school, I wanted to be a video artist really young because I, I liked um, animation. Um, and I took a hand at video editing and I really just disliked it, you know, so just listening to what you end up being kind of um, excited about in a very emotional and, and sort of non-intellectual way, because I think that that um, helps to motivate a long and generative life in art, you know? Um, yeah, and I, I, I think also things like looking at art is really important too. Um, looking at art from all over the world and the, you know, being totally inclusive of, you know, art that is on restaurant menus to museums and just being totally porous um, just so that you can kind of distill over time um, um, who you authentically are. Yeah, Don, what, what, how, do you, how do you answer this question when, when people ask you? Um, I agree with, with, you know, with Tammy as well. I, I think a lot of it has to do with just doing the work and that consistency and, and that um, sort of that cadence and rhythm of just producing always gets you somewhere. Even if you didn't for sure know what you were trying to say or do, if you kept at it, one day you reach the end of the sentence and you, you understand what was it you're trying to say. And there's, there's no shortcut to it. You, you can't, I think a lot of young artists or, or younger assistants that I meet, um, there's always this fear of wanting to know exactly what they are doing, wanting to know what the end is without even having started on, on the first step. And I think it's, it's in the doing that you figure it out. And there's just no easy way. And, and you just have to, to go through that, that process. And um, I agree that it's, it's about being always curious and always open and saying yes to a lot of things and to things that may not make sense, but somehow you, it has you know, sort of turned on your curiosity. It's flip, flipped open a button, um, a switch goes off and, and to, to embrace the irrationality of what you're drawn to. And I think that that always leads you somewhere. And then the third thing is just fucking hard work. Um, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, I think the, the end of any artist's career is really the end point of one's life. So it's, it's a long, long, long road. And, and you got to love it and just go for it. Yeah. Kevin, do you want to add anything to that? It's a long life. <laughs> Gotta keep going all the way to the end. What do you What do you tell people who you see are are at sort of still even at, at an earlier phase than you are? Oh wait, Evan, sorry, can't hear you. Unmute. Um, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I think in my aspect way of like making art, right? I think you have to be not enough to crack your question that you're asking or find like finding I agree with Tammy also now. like maybe you need to learn more tools to going forward mm. but you have to I, I think I I think everyone have their own way of like expressing especially some like teenager they want to like they always want to 
explore their childhood. So I believe that every like family and every people have the different uh, say status of feeling. So not enough and like explore it and, and, and communicate that, 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 that also how I like to and love to listen to of the artists. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, th I just to sort of wrap up, I, I, I really see in all of your practices, even though materially and aesthetically, they're very different and distinct. Um, this, you're all on these voyages of discovery in your practice, you know, like, uh, whether it's just starting from drawing or starting from painting, starting from a design language or like a book binding, like, you know, these things, they all be, just become the beginning of these encounters with materials and other people and spaces and experiences that you're kind of creating for audiences. Um, so I think it's really interesting how you guys are all sort of still very much in the process of discovery and on these voyages, which, you know, I think is what makes it, uh, what animates your works. Um, so thank you so much, all of you for uh, joining us. Thank you, Nav, and thank you, Don. Thanks, Tammy. And thank you, Aaron and Jun. Thanks for helping us also. Um, yeah, um, and thank you to C Focus for hosting this. And uh, for those who are fortunate enough to be in Singapore to get to see uh, C Focus in person, hope you will do that for us, who, those of us who can't be there. Um, and so thanks to the panelists and thank you again to everyone at C Focus. So, and thanks for joining us tonight. All right, take care guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Take a quick picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we can, we can, panelists can.